Hello and thanks for joining us for today's video. We hope that your holidays were wonderful and your new year is off to a great start. In today's video, we're going to talk about three alleged serial killers who were identified in 2022. Our next video will be a sequel to this video, so stay tuned for that. But before we get into the video, we want to tell you that we're still creating episodes of our podcast, Into the Killing. It's about cold cases that were eventually solved. We have nearly 70 episodes and we'll be releasing new episodes bi-weekly in 2023. You can download Into the Killing on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Music, and anywhere you find your favorite podcasts. We're also releasing new videos on our other channel, Paranormally Listed. We have new videos coming out that might interest fans of true crime. This includes haunted houses of serial killers, ghosts of death row inmates, and ghosts who solve their own murders. We have links to both Into the Killing and Paranormally Listed in the description box. We'll also have a link to Paranormally Listed at the end of this video. And now, we want to bring you a word from our amazing sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. What do you get when you cross a blockbuster movie in a high caliber video game and then make it available to play on your smartphone? You get the revolutionary Raid Shadow Legends. There's so many ways to play Raid, like Campaign, Faction Wars, the PvP Arena, just to name a few. But my favorite way to play is the dungeons. In the dungeons, your team battles gigantic and terrifying bosses. There's some big news from Raid. Now is the time to sign up because they are celebrating 12 days of Raid. What you want to do is download Raid Shadow Legends from the links below, copy your player ID from in-game, and then go to 12daysofraid.blarium.com, which is also in the description. Once you've entered your player ID, set off on a 12-day adventure that runs until January 10th. Each day, there's a new chapter of this wintry story and a new minigame to play. You can win some amazing in-game and real-life prizes like holiday-themed raid champions and even Amazon gift cards valued up to $1,000. And if you're an existing raid player, there's something for you too. Just go to 12daysofraid.blarium.com. The other huge news is that there's a legendary champion based on the one and only MMA pro wrestling legend, Ronda Rousey. You can get Ronda free right now whether you're a new or long-time player, just by logging on to Raid. To get Ronda, all you have to do is log in to play Raid for 7 days between now and February 20th. That's it. Raid is celebrating Ronda's arrival by giving all players a bunch of helpful stuff like 3-day 100% experience boost, 500,000 silver, and 5 full energy refills. It's perfect for leveling up Ronda so she's as tough in the game as she is in real life. Just under the promo code Raid Ronda in game and all these goodies can be yours. If you haven't started playing Raid yet, click on my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen and you'll get unique bonuses worth $35. We're talking a free Epic Champion, Jotun, 100,000 silver, 50 gems, and 2 epic tomes. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. It's available for 30 days for new players only. And once you're in the game, come find me under the name C-Listed and if you're fast enough, you can join my clan. Number 3. Monty R. Murs. In early 1956, 20-year-old Joseph Earl Jepson and his wife, 18-year-old Barbara Jean Jepson, lived in an apartment in the Van Nuys neighborhood of Los Angeles, California. The couple got married in July 1955. Barbara was four months pregnant and she expected to give birth in July 1956. Joseph worked as a clerk at California Air National Guard. On the morning of January 31st, 1956, Barbara wasn't feeling well when Joseph left for work. But that afternoon, she went on a shopping trip. She purchased a new wedding band for Joseph because he had been unhappy with the one he had been wearing since they got married. No one saw or heard Barbara return home. By 3.30 p.m., Neighbors heard loud voices and the radio blaring in the apartment. About an hour later, Joseph returned home. He found his wife's new dead body on the bedroom floor. A bent knife was protruding from her chest. She had been viciously stabbed three times. Her liver, lung, and heart were all punctured. Although she was naked, it did not appear that she had been sexually assaulted. It seems as if the killer surprised her when she got home and changed out of her clothes from her shopping trip. The clothes were on the floor beside her body. A nylon was tied around her right wrist. 
One odd thing was that the police found no signs of a struggle. Also, there were no signs of a break-in or forced entry. But they did find blood on clothes in the closet. It looked as if the killer had rifled through the closet looking for something. A man in a green army-style jacket and plaid shirt was seen hanging around outside her apartment building before the murder. Later, a green jacket was found in a garage near the crime scene. It was splattered with blood. The leading suspect in the case was Barbara's husband, Joseph. The police put a chemical on his hands and it showed they had recently come into contact with blood. But Joseph had an alibi. He was at work the entire day. However, he only lived 10 minutes from his workplace. So the police thought that he could have slipped away, murdered his wife, and gone back to work without anyone noticing. However, while the police suspected it might have been Joseph, they couldn't find any evidence proving he had killed his wife. For decades, suspicion hung around Joseph. He eventually remarried and had two sons. Joseph died in 2006 at the age of 70. In 2019, a detective named Rachel Evans was assigned to the Van Nuys Cold Case Unit. One of the first cases she was assigned to was Barbara Jepson's murder. In the 60 years since the murder, hundreds of detectives had looked at it. When Detective Evans looked at the case, she concluded that Barbara most likely knew her killer. There were no signs of a break-in and there was no struggle. Also, no valuables were missing. Not even the new wedding band she had purchased. The killer might have been looking for something, but it's unknown what he was looking for or if he found it. Evans began looking at people in Barbara's life who had a history of violence. One man stuck out, Monty R. Murs. Murs's common-law wife was Barbara's mother from 1948 to 1954. Murs was an alcoholic and a child molester. His MO was to date or marry women with young daughters. He would then sexually abuse the girls. That's what Evans believed he did with Barbara. In 1955, the same year Barbara and Joseph married, Murs married for the fourth time. Like his other wives, this woman had a young daughter. Then, on July 8, 1964, Murs married for a fifth time. Her name was Ina, and she had two sons and a daughter. Later, in 1964, Merce was arrested after he had been accused of sexually abusing a 14-year-old girl. It was the only time he was arrested for abusing a young girl. He was released on bail. Later that year, Merce was shot. He went to the hospital and told the staff they had been shot in an accident. But Evans thinks that someone intentionally shot him. After Merce was arrested for molesting the young teenager, he was questioned about two murders. One of them was the murder of Barbara Jepson. Initially, Murs denied knowing her. Well, the police knew he had lived with Barbara's mother for years and he had been at her funeral. The other murder Murs was questioned about happened in 1960. On November 25, 1960, 15-year-old Marianne Pedroda, who lived in North Hollywood, was riding her horse in the hills above San Fernando. She was found dead by two hikers. Initially, it was thought that she had been shot to death, but then it was later determined that she had been stabbed nine times in the back and once in the arm. No arrests were made in the wake of her murder. It turned out that Merce knew Marianne. He had a horse in the stable next to Marianne and they used to go on rides together. Murs was given a polygraph exam about the murder of both young women. Detective Evans said that the results indicated he had definite guilty knowledge. On August 15, 1965, Murs was away trial for abusing the 14-year-old girl, but many questions about his criminal activities started swirling. 
that his wife, Ida Mers, found a pair of young girl's underwear hidden in a drawer. She started questioning Mers about it and demanded to know whom they belonged to. They started arguing and Mers grabbed his 38 caliber gun. Ina ran out into the street and Mers chased after her. Mers caught up to his 42 year old wife in the street and shot her twice, killing her. Mers then went inside and shot himself in the head. He was 53 years old. After that, the murders of Marianne Pedroda and Barbara Jepson went cold again. Then in 2017, the police received a phone call from a woman who has never been publicly identified. She said that 57 years earlier, in 1960, when she was 10 years old, her stepfather was Monty Mers. He had sexually abused her and other girls in the neighborhood. She said that she remembered him coming home covered in blood on the day 15-year-old Marianne Pedroda was killed. The woman said that she was so terrified of murders that she wanted to wait until he was dead and everyone who knew him was dead before she told the police. She said that although she was 67, she still had nightmares about murders every night. She also said that murders liked to keep tabs on the girls he had abused so that they would continue to be afraid of him and would keep quiet about the abuse. This is why Evans believes Merz killed Barbara Jepson. She believes that Merz went over to her home, possibly to intimidate her. Barbara may have said something that sent him off and he killed her. Or she may have had proof of the abuse and mentioned it. Or he knew about the evidence before he went there. He killed her and looked through the closet for the incriminating evidence. But it's unknown if he found what he was looking for. Another possibility is that he was looking for something to wear because his jacket was bloody. Detective Evans also noted that Merz looks a lot like the sketch of the suspect from Barbara's murder. Witnesses also said that the killer was wearing a plaid shirt. Merz wore plaid shirts often. When he was arrested in 1965, he was wearing a plaid shirt in his mugshot. When Detective Evans reopened the case, only a few pieces of physical evidence were left from Barbara's murder. Detective Evans sent them to the crime lab to have them tested for DNA. Evans also tracked down one of Murr's sons. He was 87 years old. She collected a DNA sample from him. Then he died two weeks later. However, the crime lab could not find enough DNA to create a full profile. In 2022, the department reviewed all the evidence Evans had collected. They believed she had enough evidence to close the case on Monty Murr's first of his three murders. It may not have been enough to bring Murr to trial for Barbara Jensen's murder, but since he was dead, that wasn't a problem. So please consider Barbara Jensen's case closed. Detective Evans thinks that Mers may have been also responsible for a series of unsolved rapes that happened around the time Barbara was killed. But no physical evidence remains to physically prove he committed them. So what is known today is that Monty Mers was a prolific child molester and serial killer. Number 2. Wesley Brownlee Alameda County, California has a shot spotter gunshot detection system. The system alerts the police whenever it registers the sound of a gunshot. At 4.18 a.m. on April 10, 2021, the police were alerted to gunshots in East Oakland. When they arrived, they found the dead body of 40-year-old Juan Miguel Vasquez. Vasquez was a part-time mechanic. He had been shot multiple times. Six days later, there was another shooting in Stockton, California. Stockton is about 72 miles from Oakland. 39-year-old Marvin Harmon was a loving father and a good cook. That April, he was crashing at the home of friends and family and staying in shelters. He was shot at 1.16 a.m. on April 16th, and he was dead when the police arrived. A couple hours later, around 3.20 a.m., 
46-year-old Natasha Latour was sleeping in a tent in a park in Stockton. She heard someone outside of her tent, so she went to investigate. She found a tall man wearing dark clothes, a hood, and a protective mask. He was armed with a handgun. He shot her nine or ten times. Latour was found by people who happened to be walking by and she was taken to the hospital. She survived her wounds. Then the killer took a hiatus. One year later, at 12.31 a.m. on July 8, 2022, 35-year-old Paul Yaw was shot to death in a park in Stockton. Yaw was the father of one. At the time, Yaw was homeless. In the summer of 2022, Salvador Dubadi Jr. was 43 years old. He had four children. He had been married for 12 years. In August 2022, he was camping beside a river in Stockton. His family said he was a promising musician and graphic artist. At 9.49 p.m. on August 11, 2022, he was shot to death next to a fast food restaurant. Weeks later, on August 30th, at 6.41 a.m., 21-year-old Jonathan Hernandez Rodriguez was shot to death in his car in Stockton. Over three weeks later, at 4.27 a.m., on September 21st, the police were called to an apartment complex in Stockton. They found 52-year-old Juan Cruz shot to death on the sidewalk. 54-year-old Lawrence Lopez Sr. was a father to six children. He had worked as a construction contractor, but he had fallen on hard times. As a result, he was homeless. On September 27, 2022, at 1.53 a.m., he was fatally shot. On September 30th, three days after Lopez was gunned down, the police announced that a serial killer was on the loose. At the time, they had only connected the murders that happened in 2022 with ballistics. They also released a still image of a man dressed in all black who was caught on a security camera walking away from one of the shootings. On October 4, 2022, the police made another announcement. They said that ballistic testing had connected the murder of Juan Miguel Vasquez to the other murders, making him the first official victim. They also released the video from where the still image was taken. They were hoping that people would recognize the way the man walked. They also announced that they were offering a $125,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. Less than two weeks later, on October 15th, the police arrested 43-year-old Wesley Brownlee. At the time, Wesley was driving his car. He was wearing all black and a mask was around his neck. He was also armed with a handgun. The police believe they were still looking for another victim. The police first suspected Wesley because they had received several tips saying he was the killer. Wesley was a truck driver who lived in Stockton. He was born in San Francisco, but at a young age, his family moved to Oakland. In May 1994, when Wesley was two weeks shy of his 15th birthday, he and two friends were arrested on suspicion of sexually assaulting a 14-year-old girl. Wesley denied being involved. Also, the young woman only implicated him in the second interview. In October 1995, Wesley's 17-year-old brother, Dale Brownlee, was shot to death in what the police called a drug-related shooting. Six months before that, a family friend was stabbed to death. About six months after his brother's murder, Wesley was arrested on suspicion of selling drugs. He was given house arrest. In 1997, when he was 18, he was arrested for possession of crack. The police believed he was going to sell it. He was convicted and spent two years in prison. He then moved to Stockton with his mother. In 2001, Wesley was convicted of possession with intent to sell and he served three years in prison. Then in 2009, he was arrested for driving under the influence. 
In 2014, he pleaded no contest to possession of cocaine. He served 16 days in jail and five years of probation. Finally, in 2019, he received a citation for failing to stop at a port of entry in Arizona. When he was arrested in October 2022, he was initially charged with three murders. The murders of Jonathan Hernandez Rodriguez, Juan Cruz, and Lawrence Lopez Sr. Then December 2022, he was charged with the murders of Juan Alexander Vasquez, Marvin Harmon, Paul Yaw, and Salvador DeBuddy Jr. and the attempted murder of Natasha Latour. Five of the seven victims were Hispanic and four were homeless. However, the police do not think that the murders were hate crimes. No trial date has been set for Wesley Brownlee. Number 1. Ralph Howell Roselawn is a neighborhood in Cincinnati, Ohio. In October 1976, 24-year-old Victoria Hitcher lived in an apartment in Roselawn with a roommate. They had been living there for about seven months. Hitcher and her husband were split up and she was dating another man. Hitcher worked as a waitress at a restaurant in Roselawn. Hitcher worked on the night of October 19, 1976 and then after she finished her shift, she went to a friend's home. She drank heavily for a few hours. Then sometime between 3 and 3.30 a.m., her friend's father drove her home. At home, Fisher got into an argument with her roommate about what to watch on television. At 5.30 a.m., Hitcher called a female roommate and told her that she was coming over. But she never arrived at her friend's home, nor did she report for work that day. Eleven days later, on Halloween 1976, Victoria Hinter's nude body was found in Lover's Lane, 80 miles west of Hamilton, Ohio. Hamilton is about 25 miles north of Roselawn. Hinter had been sexually assaulted. The cause of death was strangulation. In the autumn of 1977, Nancy Ann Theobald was 18 years old and enrolled at the University of Cincinnati. She was studying finances. Theobald's father was a respected veterinarian. That autumn, Theobald lived in an off-campus apartment with her brother and sister. She was also working at a fast food restaurant close to her home. On the evening of November 16, 1977, she worked a shift at the restaurant. Sometimes when she was done, she would call her brother for a ride. But that night, she planned on walking home. Unfortunately, she never made it there. Neither friends or family believed she had run away or chose to disappear. She had no problems with her life. She was also very dedicated to her friends, boyfriend, family, and her studies. On the day after Christmas 1977, a farmer made a horrifying discovery. It was the frozen body of a young woman in Mud Creek on his property. It was determined to be the body of 18-year-old Nancy Theobald, who had been missing for about a month and a half. Her wrists were bound behind her back and a rope was wrapped around her neck. The medical examiner determined that she had been raped and strangled to death. Weeks later, in early 1978, 17-year-old Charmaine Stola was a sophomore in high school. She lived with her family in Cincinnati. Stola was an outgoing person who liked helping people. For example, one time she came across a traffic jam. She directed traffic and got everyone moving again. One time at school, she discovered that some girls had blocked the drains by stuffing them full of paper towels. She removed the paper towels herself. But Stola had a bit of an edge to her. One time she was caught smoking in the girls' bathroom at school. She also smoked marijuana. What concerned her mother the most was that she hung out with homeless people in downtown Cincinnati. Her mother said it was because she always wanted to help people. On the night of February 23, 1978, Stola went to a small get-together with some friends. 
She's left by herself to go buy some drugs. The party's host thought she was coming back because she left a pair of earrings behind, but she didn't return to the get-together. After the party, she was supposed to meet a friend at a bowling alley. She didn't show up to that, either. Initially, her family wasn't too worried because she'd run away for a week before. Then their family learned that no one had seen or heard from her since the night of the get-together. So her family reported missing on March 3rd. On March 15th, some hunters were in a wooded area about 15 miles north of Cincinnati. They came across the partially clad body of 17-year-old Charmaine Stola. She had been raped and strangled to death. Three months later, in March 1978, 19-year-old Cheryl Thompson was a freshman at the University of Cincinnati. She lived in a dormitory on campus. On the night of March 24th, 1978, she was at her family's apartment, which was about 10 miles east of the campus. She planned on meeting her boyfriend at a local disco, but she didn't show up, so her boyfriend drove around looking for her. Around 5.30 a.m., he spotted her car, but something was wrong. A man was driving it. The boyfriend tried to follow the car, but he lost it. He found the car later that day. Thompson was reported missing that day. On April 8th, 1978, nearly two weeks after Thompson went missing, a state wildlife official found her body on the banks of the Little Miami River in Loveland, Ohio. Loveland is about 23 miles north of Cincinnati. She had been sexually assaulted, beaten in the head with a blunt object, and strangled to death. Over the years, the police investigated the murders, but never made progress on any of them. Then in 2022, the police submitted the rape kit from Cheryl Thompson's murder to a genetic genealogy company. It led them to a man named Ralph Howell who had lived in Roselawn. He was a long haul truck driver and he delivered newspapers for the Cincinnati Inquirer. The police checked his background and in January 1983 he had been arrested. He was driving his newspaper delivery vehicle he pulled up to a young woman walking alone. He offered her a ride twice, but she said no both times. The third time he offered her a ride, he said, I'm not no animal, you know. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going your way. I'll give you a ride. So she got into his vehicle. He told her he wanted to have sex with her and started strangling her with a rope. She fought him off and was able to escape. Hal was arrested and charged with abduction. He pleaded guilty to a lesser charge and he didn't serve any time in prison. In March 1985, 35-year-old Ralph Hal and his 33-year-old wife were involved in a multi-car collision. Hal was killed. Since Ralph Hal was already dead when the police learned he was a suspect, they got a DNA sample from one of his family members and they determined there was a familial match. Then in the summer of 2022, the police had Hal's body exhumed and got a DNA sample from his jawbone. It was a match to the DNA found in the rape kit. After the match was made, the district attorney met with the Thompson family and offered to present the evidence to the grand jury, even though Hal could never go to trial. They accepted the offer. However, this is yet to happen. There is no DNA evidence from the other three murders, so it could not be tested. Despite the lack of DNA evidence, the investigators believe that based on the similarities between their murders and the murder of Cheryl Thompson, Hal also killed them. They also believe he may have other victims. The police said that they are continuing to investigate Ralph Hal. But after nearly four and a half decades, the police consider the murders of the four women closed. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. 
Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.